Do you want to hear something really funny? So I visited Wright State for my exam studies grad program visit. And I talked with a graduate student, and she wrote a prospectus on whether or not the West was really wild. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. Huh. And so um, I asked her, I was like, I'm going to write the exact same thing from life as you did in West class. Send me some of your sources and perspectives so I can take a look at them and send them all over. So is that okay if I. Sure. Sounds great. Good. <laughs> all right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. I uh, hope you're all doing well. I'm very glad to see you. I'm glad everybody made it back safely from fall break. And now we've got that, that weird stretch in the semester between this and Thanksgiving. And then, of course, we turn back to Thanksgiving, and it's over almost instantly. So uh, there are a couple of things I want to talk about today. In fact, I've got a, a number of different topics, and I'm not quite sure how far we're going to get in this. <coughs> Uh, so let me just address quickly what you have, uh, okay, your tests. I thought I'd have them done today. I still have a couple more left to grade, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm really enjoying them. They've been very good, and I'm actually just reading them word for word, going through all of them, and they've been fantastic so far. So I hope to have this to you by Thursday, and I know I'm getting really late with that, and I apologize, but they, they should be done relatively soon. They're actually taking a little bit longer than I expected, um, not just because I've been traveling, but actually reading, you guys wrote so much, which is my fault, but I had you write that much. Um, but it's just, almost all of you filled up your blue books. So I'm reading 16 pages from each one of you, which is good, uh, but it is definitely, definitely a lot. So, uh, but good stuff and I'm enjoying it. So thank you, thanks for putting the kind of time you did into the test. Uh, I know that you obviously prepared and you were thinking about the questions and so it means a lot to me. Uh, it really means a lot. So the other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of housekeeping, and though actually even before we get to that, I want to talk about Miles for a moment too. I, I want to thank you all very much for being here for Dr. Smith's lecture. I thought he gave a, an excellent lecture. I think he's a natural. He was very happy to be here. Uh, I do want to say, though, that I, I want to put just a couple of things in context of what he said, because he was pretty disparaging about settlers in particular, and that's totally fine. I mean, he has every right to his own viewpoint on these things. But Miles comes out, or Dr. Smith comes out of a school of thought called the New Western School of Historiography. And it really developed in the late 1980s and earth into the early 1990s, so right about the time he would have been finishing, uh, well, he was he's younger than that, but he would have been uh, on his way to college and then into graduate school. It was a, a big form of, a big way of understanding, important way of understanding what the West was. And the main book that came out was a book that came out in 1987 by a fantastic scholar. I don't agree with her on a lot of this, but her name's Patricia Nelson Limerick. Uh, very good scholar. I almost almost assigned something from her this semester for you guys, but she's definitely worth knowing. And she wrote a book in 1987 called The Legacy of Conquest. And basically her whole theory is that the settlement of the West was one of the worst things that ever happened in society. It was terrible for our society. It was terrible for Indian society. It was terrible for the environment. She was doing environmental history long before others were doing it. And she sees this legacy of conquest as really a kind of soft form of imperialism. And that's, that's where Miles was coming from when he was talking about where settlers are. So I tend to, and I'm sure this is pretty obvious after having had me now for almost 10 weeks, I tend to focus much more on the mythical and the heroic element of what's going on. Miles is looking at the much more kind of nitty gritty, and they're both, I think, legitimate ways of thinking about it. But he certainly was very concerned with what the settler was doing and how the settler was shaping the American character. So I just wanted to give that a little bit of context of where he's coming from. He also, please remember, he is talking about or was talking about specifically settlement from about the War of 1812 until the Mexican War. So he's really looking at that one time period there. What generally is known as the Great Migration, we'll have another Great Migration, that's when blacks moved to the north 
out of the South in the 19 teens, 20s, and 30s. But the first Great Migration was the movement of peoples out of the East into the West and the early West, so the West of Michigan and the West of Indiana and then the West of Texas, all that time period in the teens, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. One of the things that Miles didn't say that I would argue is really important, and it, he didn't not not say it, he just, it wasn't there in his speech. This is also the only time period in American history where you have very low immigration to America. So almost all of the settlement that's taking place in the 18 teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s is natural settlement by those women that we've talked about, those families that were having like 13 kids a piece. So and that will continue. It's before and it's after. But what's different about that time period is we just have very low immigration to the United States. So our first immigration, as we talked about, were the immigrants of the, the Anglicans and the Quakers and the Puritans and the Scotch-Irish and blacks against their will. We won't see a fifth or sixth wave of immigration, sixth if you count blacks in there. We won't see a sixth wave of immigration until the middle to late 1840s, exactly the end of the time period that Miles was talking about. And then we're going to see massive numbers, uh, unheard of numbers, of uh, Germans who mostly settle on the frontier and Irish who mostly settle in the East Coast cities. So Irish almost always stick to Baltimore, they stick to New York. Uh, they stick to Jersey City, all of the places, uh, Boston. They tend to go only to the urban areas. And that, yeah, you guys are too young to remember this now, but yeah, it wasn't accidental that 96% of the people who died in 9-11, those people who were first responders, were from the Irish-American community of New York. I mean, it's just, that's just the way of the Irish, how they settled. Uh, to, uh, very rarely did Irish settle on the frontier. They're almost always urban. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, but generally the Irish are urban. The Germans are almost always frontier. Very rarely are they urban. And when they do go to urban places, they go to small frontier urban places like Fort Wayne or Cincinnati or St. Louis, but they don't generally go to huge metropolises like Chicago, uh, especially after Chicago really grew, though there are Germans in Chicago, mostly because there are so many Germans in Wisconsin and Illinois. Uh, I don't know if you can do this easily, and I, I didn't bring the URL in, but if you type in in Google, if you go to immigration 1850, so America immigration 1850, if you type that into Google, you'll get uh, a whole series of maps that come up, not just uh, a map of 1850, but there's actually someone has gone through and it, it goes way too quickly there. The maps are changing like that, it's hard to focus. But they start in 1840 and show where all the immigration goes to America all the way up to 2020. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to see, it's just, it actually made me a little physically sick because it was happening so quickly and I was trying to focus on certain states. Uh, but it's still worth looking at if you get a chance. So it's just in Google, type out American Immigration Map 1850 and uh, it'll come up and you can see that. It's, I think, like the fifth or sixth thing down on images if you go to the images section. So worth, worth checking out. But I didn't even want to do it in here because the, it's just too rapid for it to be that useful, but it is kind of neat. So anyway, uh, we're going to see huge numbers of immigrants coming in, and that's part of what I want to talk about today. I want to look at some of the immigration that we're going to see coming to the American West, but it will be a different character. If you have, remember, Abraham Lincoln said that the West was for every Hans, Baptiste, and Patrick. Uh, that's what the West was for. It, it does matter if you're settling your frontier communities with immigrants as opposed to with Native Americans, not Native Americans, but Native-born Americans, it is whites, Native-born whites. Uh, it does change the character of a place, and we'll see that, that there's going to be kind of a, an old rivalry. So also a lot of the settlement that Miles was talking about is also Scotch-Irish settlement, and especially coming out of places like Tennessee and going to Missouri and going to Texas. And so it, it's not the immigrants from 
the sixth or seventh or eighth waves of immigration, but immigration from the first wave of immigration in which those original Scotch-Irish are getting very, very uncomfortable and very hemmed in where they are on the East Coast. So they're starting to move quickly into the West as well. And we'll see that a lot of Scotch-Irish names, very famous Scotch-Irish names throughout Texas history and throughout that whole region uh, will have a lot of Scotch-Irish as a part of that, as we'll see in the American Civil War uh, as well. There's even an argument that I don't know how many of you are familiar with the historian Forrest MacDonald, a great historian of the American Revolution, but he actually argues that the reason the Confederacy wins the first two years of the Civil War is because it's all the Scotch-Irish doing the fighting and they're wiped out by the end of 1862. By 1863, you've lost that Celtic element of Southern manhood and Southern valor. And I think that argument's a little extreme, but it's still, when you think about the nature of the Scotch-Irish, people like Bowie and Travis and Barrett, these people who show up in Texas, they are forces of nature in all kinds of ways. And I don't think we really see comparable versions in other ethnic groups like we do see with the Scotch-Irish. So, Alex, did you have a question? Um, it, it was about the Scotch-Irish thing, but that's... Sure. that's um, so, his argument is that that idea of the ferocity of the Scotch-Irish... Yeah, that was, element of was, violent manhood. And, and so, that is replaced by a more refined and... Well, they're all killed. So then right, it becomes, so then what, then what are they replaced yeah, by? Yeah, they're replaced with a much more refined, the, the kind of Anglican gentleman coming out of Virginia. So still worthy fighters, definitely, but not at the level that you saw in those first two years. I think, and this has to be the worst title for a book ever, but I think Forrest McDonald's book is called Attack and Die. So <laughs> not, I mean, it's memorable, but not a, not a great title. So, yeah, yes. Do we know, Sydney. I, I don't know if this is too off topic, but do we know well, why the Irish primarily settled in the East and the Germans primarily in the like Midwest area? Like, is it just because that's the character of people or were they coming for different reasons? Yeah, part of it was the, the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party from the early 1840s started setting up all kinds of shop around where immigrants were coming in. And so they it, literally the Irish would get off the boat and the Democratic Party would enroll them in the Democratic Party and then find jobs for them, usually public service jobs like police work. So that's one reason, I mean, it's not, it's not a, it is a stereotype, but it's not an untrue stereotype to talk about the Irish cop uh, and on his, the, the Irishman on his beat. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty typical way of thinking about the Irish, especially on the East Coast. So a lot of police departments. Whereas you'll see later, um, and I, I don't know the exact details of all of this, but when the Italians start coming in in the 1880s and 90s, they do similar things, but usually with the Republican Party. Italians tend to be far more Republican than the Irish do, and they usually go into the fire service. That is, they're, they're, they're firemen. Uh, generally in large cities, the Irish are, are the Italians are. So you still see some of that. Again, in East Coast cities, you'll find those kind of ethnic stereotypes. So, yeah, that's... I mean, one reason, for example, you don't have a lot of black cops in New York actually has nothing to do with being anti-black. It has everything to do with it just being pro-Irish. And so the Irish have controlled it for so long. And that's, that's finally starting to fall apart. But, I mean, we're, we're talking 150, almost 200 years of that tradition at this point. So, yeah, Alex. And to answer Sydney's thing about the Germans and why they primarily settled in the Midwest. They wanted farmland. Exactly. Um, I did some research for my museum studies class yeah. on German immigration. And that's primarily why, because they come from, during the Industrial Revolution, they, you know, a lot of the farmland has been taken up in Bavaria and all those other places. And so when they get displaced, they come over to the rich soil in Nebraska yeah. and the Wisconsin Dakotas and everything. Yeah. And, yeah. And yeah, so. absolutely. They're also primarily Republicans. A lot of the Germans... It's mixed. Lutherans tend to be Republicans. Uh, German Catholics tend to be Democrats. Yeah. So, but yeah, but there's more Lutherans than Catholics who come. So it's a fair statement, definitely. Good. Okay, anything else on this? So I just, I, I thought Miles was fantastic, just excellent. But I, I wanted to give that a little bit of context to, to kind of explain what was going on. Okay, so what I want to do then for right now, I, I told you we're going to cover a lot today. We've done a lot of we've been 
I want to talk about your paper and the paper that you're working on for me for this semester and give you at least an idea of how I approach research when I'm trying to do these things and especially uh, for those of you who decided to stick with the original topic and go with a biographical overview. Remember, as I told at least uh, you individually, I don't think I told the whole group this, but that biographical element was really a way to try and get you to decide on a topic. And it was more, it, meant, it was meant to be a kind of way of easing in to a topic itself. Once you're into that topic, and you realize that you can't just do a straight biography. That's, I'm fine with that. Uh, I just wanted it to be that kind of opening entree into what you might do. But if you're thinking about biography, and hopefully this will be helpful not just for this class, but for any class, I just want to give a couple of pointers about what I think is important uh, uh, with biography. And I've had the, the good fortune in my professional life to write a couple of biographies. And I consider it, as you'll see here on my slides, I consider it to be a, a relatively high form of history. I don't know if it's necessarily the highest form of history, but I do think it's a pretty important aspect of trying to understand how to approach a historical topic. And I, I will say from my own standpoint, a lot of this comes from the love of my grandmother and my grandfather on my maternal side. And they're going to show up in here, as you'll see, in probably the second set of slides. But I was absolutely fascinated as a kid with my grandparents. I mean, they're the most dignified people I ever knew. My, my grandfather was without question the most dignified man I've ever known. And my grandmother, she was the best cook I've ever known. Um, also incredibly dignified and hilarious in all kinds of ways. Uh, they both have been gone for a long time. My grandfather passed away in 1982, and my grandmother in 2003. But believe me, the memories are, are strong. And so even as a kid, I was always fascinated with their stories, the stories of how they met, how, how they danced together. My, my grandmother at a dance had a, a sash, a handkerchief over her shoulder, and when she went by my grandfather, she had it drop so that he would pick it up, and that's how they started talking to each other. <laughs> um, yeah, and that, this was part of the custom of, of what you were supposed to do, too. It's how women let men know that they were interested in them on the dance floor. And it worked. I mean, so I wouldn't be here had that <laughs> handkerchief not fallen off <laughs> my grandmother's shoulder. And uh, they had an amazing, absolutely amazing marriage. And, and I'll talk about that. Okay, so and you, look at this. I actually did transitions for this PowerPoint. This is how much this PowerPoint actually means to me. Okay, so for all of you as you're doing research, clearly the most important thing you need to do at the beginning is just get your facts. You get your names and your dates. I would never want you to focus exclusively on names and dates. That starts to become antiquarian after a while. But the names and dates are important in the same way that when you were taking the exam for me, I'm much more interested in a larger picture. But any time that you can impress me with this fact or that fact or this name or that date, it, it mattered, definitely. And it helped your essays. So you want to think about dates. You want to think about outlines. You want to think about the forms of things but essentially the facts. But what's more important then is that you really think about the essence of something. So the facts always form the kind of body of a thing, but it's the essence, it's the soul that you really want to try and understand. And it doesn't matter if you're focusing on Meriwether Lewis, who obviously had an extremely tormented soul, or someone like Buffalo Bill Cody, or Willa Cather, Obviously, Catherine can write about tortured souls very, very easily, very readily. You have to think about the essence of a thing. And it's not just the essence of a person, but the essence of an event, the essence of a moment. So trying to figure out what are the motivations of that thing. And I think we can really only understand that when we're thinking about the soul itself. And then I would ask, ultimately, once we've got the names and the dates, and then we figure out what our personality or what our soul or psyche, whatever you want to call it, what it's like. And we're looking at these figures, and we can do this for ourselves as well, autobiographically. But then we have to ask, what motivates a person? So it's not atypical to find two people with very similar personalities who are motivated by radically different things. And they may be brothers, or they may be siblings of some kind. Uh, they could have a very close relationship to one another, but motivations can really change, and they can matter. So the kinds of motivations maybe you have at 17 are very different than maybe what they are at 23 after you've just done a tour of duty with the Marines. 
And so our motivations can change dramatically, and that's not a constant for us. And our motivations can change momentarily, they can change over time, they can change quickly, or they can change slowly. But the kinds of motivations, for example, I have as a 54-year-old are probably much different than what you have as a 20 or 21-year-old. And my motivations at age 54 are very different than they were when I was 21 uh, as well. And so we have to see that these motivations, as we're thinking about people, change with time and they evolve over time. So what moves us? Family, honor, duty, sometimes selfishness. Sometimes just sin, love. I had love twice. I've forgotten I had that in there, but love's so important. Probably should have had it another time. Right? Anger, annoyance, persistence, hatred, desire. And, and all of these things are mixed for us when we think about our own motivations individually. So even in a good conversation in the cafeteria, having that conversation and then maybe walking away from that conversation, we recognize that there were complexities of emotions going on in the way that we talk to someone, in the way that we approach them, and in the way that we may walk away from them. But all of these things matter. Sometimes there's an attractiveness. That person may be incredibly charismatic. Sometimes a charismatic person can be repulsive for a moment because they've forgotten what their charisma is and they've said something stupid, and we're not quite sure where it came from. It seems out of context. But all of these motivations matter as we're thinking about the real complexity of the individual. And that's what we're trying to figure out as we think about what all of this comes down to. So the facts and the essence and the motivations, we're trying to define the human person. We're trying to figure out what the human person is. You guys are curious, those are my two older brothers. So one of our many brother trips there in Chicago, uh, it was an unbelievably cold day. As you can tell from us being very bundled up, but it was a, a, a great day as well. So what we're trying to find is essentially in our research, we're trying to meet our subject. We're trying to discover who they are as individuals. And never will we write about somebody, if you're writing about Buffalo Bill, you drew, and I, know, I don't remember what you're writing about, Drew, but yours is looking at me, so I'll use you as an example. Drew writing about Buffalo Bill will always be a particular take on Buffalo Bill because it's Drew's take on Buffalo Bill. And the fact that this is first semester of his senior year, probably he's going to approach Buffalo Bill differently than he would have his freshman year of college. Uh, and he would probably even differently maybe his third year of grad school because there is a certain understanding of where he is in this time, in this place, at this moment that allows him to think about certain things and given the context of this course, there may be certain questions that he's going to ask that he wouldn't have asked elsewhere. And so if Alex decides to write about Buffalo Bill, they're going to have two very different takes on what Buffalo Bill is. In other words, just like when you meet a friend and another person meets a friend, your friendships aren't quite the same thing, even if there's a, a group of three of you or four of you you always reply to different people in different ways, and then you add a third or a fourth or a fifth, and they ask questions that you wouldn't have thought of because that's not your personality. But now it becomes your personality because someone else entered into that conversation. This is what we're doing when we talk to Buffalo Bill. We're trying to figure out who he is, and we're trying to get to know him. But I can only, as a biographer, get to know him as Brad Berzer. So I, I can't... I can do my best to see the world through his eyes, and I think we have to do that, but it will always be Brad Berzer's eyes through Buffalo Bill's eyes. It will not be Sydney's eyes through Buffalo Bill's eyes. I could look at Buffalo Bill through Sydney's eyes, but then it would be Brad's eyes through Sydney's eyes through Buffalo Bill's eyes. That's what I do when I grade your papers. That's what every professor does when they're grading your papers. And that, this is, so we have to imagine this isn't just true in real life. This is true as we approach our historical subjects. And we have to give Buffalo Bill his due. He's a man. And as J.R.R. Tolkien said, there's no greater tragedy in this life than being born. That, that's the tragedy. It's also beautiful, and it's incredible. But you think about everything that's wrapped up in being born. You're born into a certain time and a certain place. You're born to a certain set of, none of us got to choose our parents. None of us chose the language. None of us chose the place where we were born. None of us chose our relatives. None of that. We had no choice about any of that, and bam, there we are. 
and we come to age, age seven, and suddenly we can make reasonable decisions and we're culpable, we're morally culpable for everything that we do. Buffalo Bill, even though he was a great celebrity, even though he did all these million different things and he was fascinating, he was still a man. And that means he has all the greatness and all the weakness of a man, right, of a person. So that's what we have to think about as we're approaching these subjects. We're not looking for perfection. We're looking for imperfection in a lot of ways. But we're also looking for goodness and truth and beauty hiding within all of that package of sin as well, right? all those follies of who and what we are. And nobody is pure, and nobody is impure. We're all this kind of, well, nobody's totally impure. We're all this kind of mixture of all of this, and that's what we have to balance as we're thinking about these things. So, sorry, Will, just <laughs> had to put in a good friend there. But what we try to do then as a biographer, that's Will's dad, by the way, if you guys don't know Dr. Smith, the ultimate professor this, I could be professor's professor at the campus, though he's gone right now, off in Chicago, but still. Um, what we try to do then, I think, as a biographer, is we want to understand what connections there are as we look at the facts, as we look at the essence, as we look at the motivations, how do we understand it? And so we may know A, and we may know B, and we may know D, and we may know C, or, or E. We know there's a C there, but we can't find it. That, that's not atypical in historical research. In fact, like theology, history is often a study of what we don't know <coughs> rather than what we know. And this is not an improper way to approach the study of history. As we're thinking about what history is, we recognize this is what we know, but there's so much we don't know. There's so much information we will never have, ever about certain things, certain events. There are certain childhoods of very famous people that we'll never know more than a sentence or two. And it makes it astounding when we do encounter someone, like, and we can even say this historically, not religiously, but imagine you encounter a figure like Jesus of Nazareth, and you're overwhelmed. There's so much stuff that was written on him. It also indicates how incredibly important he was in the ancient world. But there's so much about him that you actually have to spend your time negating the bad stuff in order to find the good stuff. There's a lot more crazy stuff written about Jesus, all the Gnostic Gospels and everything, than there are the good things that were written about him. We generally don't have that problem in history. But if you pick someone famous, let's say, for example, you're deciding to do Andrew Jackson for this class, or you want to do Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln fought in the 1832 Black Hawk War on the frontier. He's, there's a frontier element to Lincoln. Lincoln's 1862 Homesteading Act. Right? You can't separate Lincoln from the frontier. But imagine if you wanted to do something on Lincoln. That would be totally different than if you wanted to do something on some actor at some point who played the Lone Ranger. Right? Where you're going to have to search and search and search to find any information at all about this person. With someone like Abraham Lincoln, you're utterly overwhelmed with how much information there is. And it, and it makes those famous people more difficult to write about in many ways, simply because there's just so much that you have to decide, what do I choose and what do I not? But again, my point I want to make here is that we have to recognize that there are many things we just simply can't know. And this is where your personality comes in. So if I see a set of facts, and let's say that I, have, I, I, I need 10 facts, I'd love to have 10 pieces of data, but I've only got four, that means I, Brad, you, each one of you individually as a historian, you have to make a judgment. First of all, you have to decide, is it worth digging and digging and digging and digging and digging, maybe for the hope of finding one more of those data points? And, and depending on where you are in school, right, if it were September and you're writing your paper, maybe now in October probably should stick with what you've got at this point and maybe if you come across something else, find it. But you're in a different stage now, in the same way that if you're writing a senior paper, for me, that's a little bit different than when you're writing your dissertation in grad school. And there, maybe, it is worth the extra few months to try and find another data point. It's not for a paper of this size. And that, that's just the norm. That's just the way things are, and you have to recognize that. 
but it also means that as I make a judgment, not just about whether to search for this thing or not, I then have to make a judgment about what's missing. And this is one of the craziest aspects of history, and I think it's one of the most beautiful aspects of history. Quite often, the best historian is making a judgment about what's not there rather than what's there. And that's hard. I mean, especially for an undergraduate, I think that's a very hard thing to grasp because so much of what you're getting in a liberal education is you're getting drilled constantly on what we do know, but then you're suddenly put into this position where you have to make a decision and a judgment based on what little you know. And that's going to happen in your papers. And that's where you have to say, I just admit in my humility, in my humbleness, I recognize that there's a lot more I don't know than I know. And there's no shame in that. In fact, the shame would be to make something up that has nothing to do with anything. I, I learned that my first year of teaching very quickly. The moment someone asks you a question, if you don't know the answer, you admit you don't know the answer. You never try and fudge your way through something you don't know what you're talking about. You can make logical guesses and you can say, well, I think this and this. But you never try and fool somebody after a speech trying to make him think that you know more than you do. You just admit it. And yeah, that's not knowing something can be as important as knowing something. And that's what we have to do when we approach these papers as well. So we want very importantly, as I put here, I think the good biographer tries to see A, B, C, D, E, and F. But importantly, he also connects one to another and where necessary, one all the way to the end of a thing as well. So we have to be able to put that together in a variety of different ways. So what happens then? That's my second daughter, Maria Grace, with her, which, that's Cinderella, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. I couldn't remember if that was Belle or Cinderella, but yeah. So in the end, what are we trying to figure out? We're trying to define what the human person is. And ultimately, for each one of you who's doing a biographical topic, you're trying to define for me who your person is. You're trying to explain what do they have to give, what have they given to the world, what is necessary in all of this, and who are these people. And so one of my famous, one of my favorite quotes from J.R.R. Tolkien, when he was asked about the meaning of allegory, and it was his former student, W.H. Auden, a very famous poet, when he was asked his, by this student about what allegory was, he said, every person is an allegory. Each embodies in a particular tale and is clothed in the garments of time and place, universal truth, and everlasting life. Now, obviously a very religious definition, but I think a wonderful one for understanding what the human person is. We recognize the universality of what humanity is, but then we get into the deep individualism, the true individualism of each person. And that individualism is radical. Even when I look at twins, the individualism of these two is astounding, despite the fact we see them together and we see them looking alike. They still, even though born minutes apart from each other, have fundamentally <coughs> different personalities. And yet there is an obvious case, you can start on me for a moment, it's an obvious case of where there is something larger than just the individual, and yet we can't escape that individuality. Sheldon, yeah, Shelby is not Sydney. Sheldon, or where that one came from. And Sydney is not Shelby, and neither of them are named Sheldon. So uh, they're their own individual human beings. And that, that's true for every one of us, no matter our situation. You guys knew Ruth Marino mm -hmm. back when she was very young? So that is where I want to make a statement, kind of throwing the gauntlet down here. But I really do think that most history, not all of history, but I do think that history really does come down to biography. It comes down to us and the individual choices we make and the way we try to understand ourselves. So in the midst of Black Lives Matter, how do we respond? In the midst of a volcano going off in Oregon, how do we respond? In the midst of an economic <coughs> downturn, how do we respond? So I didn't personally have anything to do with Black Lives Matter. I didn't have anything to do with that volcano going off, and, and I have nothing to do with what's happening with the economy, right? except who I am and the kinds of decisions that I make. But now that those things that are outside of my control are there, 
I can't make a decision. What do I think about Black Lives, Black Lives Matter? How do I respond to the volcanic activity? Uh, maybe I want to go out and see what the aftermath is like, or I want to see what it did to crops, or I want to see what it did to the atmosphere in that area, or I want to think about the economics. And I decide that because the economy is downturned so much, but I'm doing fine here at Hillsdale, maybe my given will be up next year. <laughs> you know, be, I'm just giving an example here of what that will be. Right? So those are the kinds of things. We don't have the choices about these huge forces, but we do have choices about how we recognize and how we deal with each one of those things. So uh, you imagine, and I have five billion, I should have seven billion up there, but every minute of every day, there are seven billion people in the world making choices, and, and bless you, Danny. Even if I did something very simple as a thought experiment, if I just right now told all of you to stop doing whatever you're doing and to recreate in your mind everything you did the previous minute before I said to stop doing things, you couldn't even reconstruct one minute of your life read it perfectly. Right? Every decision you made, every thought you had, how long is Bruce going to talk about it? I'm really sorry I missed the cafeteria today and it's a long way till dinner. Or should I be writing this down right now? You know, he told me not to. Or does this really apply to my paper? Or we're all, every moment of every day, we're making a million decisions. We're more with babies. And imagine multiplying that by seven billion people in the world, all making decisions all the time. Hey, this is fundamental and it's radical all at the same time as we're trying to think about these things. So, good friend of mine from college and his wife. So we're trying to think about biography, but the same questions could be asked about autobiography except for one thing. All autobiography, even the greatest ever written, St. Augustine's, is self-indulgent. And there's no way around it. All autobiography, unlike biography, is self-indulgent. Because rarely do we normally in life give so much attention to ourselves that we can write a book about it. So there is something very self-involved, and you have to remember that as you're reading autobiographies for your subjects. They can be very, very, very helpful. But you have to recognize they're always an exercise in self-indulgence even when you have someone like Augustine. And if you've ever read Augustine's Confessions, I mean, this is a guy who wallows in his sin for a long time before he gets to his salvation. So there, there's definitely self-indulgence there in all of it, even in someone like Augustine. Okay, so four things that I want to sum this up with and try and figure out what all of this means. So one of the first things we have to decide when we look at a person and here we just use the classical virtues, we use the virtue of prudence, and we use the virtue of temperance. We have to discern what is good and what is ill about the person. No one's gonna be perfect. Thomas Jefferson's not perfect, George Washington's not perfect, Buffalo Bill's not perfect. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect. And so we have to recognize, we look at someone like George Washington, incredible man. I would argue he's the greatest American who ever lived, but, he was also a slaveholder. There's no question about that. We're not going to escape that. Now, he did things at the end of his life that probably acquit him in the court of history from being ultimately only just a slave owner. He did amazing things. He was a bit of a womanizer, knew it as a young man, and partly he was incredibly handsome and very charismatic and certainly was very attractive to people. And he had a temper, okay? Knowing those things, what does that tell us about the goodness of the man? So he's not perfect, but how does he in his own life recognize his own flaws and try and make them better? In other words, when we look at the ill of somebody, when we look at the bad side of somebody, we're not passing judgment against their sin because we all do that. We're trying to recognize how is that part of them integrated into the whole of their character. I think about Benjamin Franklin and his list of virtues that he creates in his own autobiography and in his own diary. Okay, autobiography already self-absorbed. Right? It's just, again, the nature of things. And then he creates his own list of virtues. Why? <coughs> because he's trying to make himself better. Not perfect, but better. 
And that, I think, I, I get so frustrated when I see things like the news and I see something like the 1619 Project and everything is nothing but our sin. I mean, can you imagine if every one of us in this room were judged by the very worst thing we ever did in our lives? I mean, if that, that was what defined us, the stupidest, wor- most worthless thing we ever did, can you imagine if that was who Brad was? I, I mean, <laughs> that's horrible. Right. And that, that's exactly what these people do with history because they think they can find perfection and they can't and they never will and they will always be frustrated and they will frustrate everybody else as well because they're trying to find this perfection. So we have to think about what's best in a person and we have to think about what's worst and we have to argue that in some way these things have to be brought into a coherent understanding of who and what we are. This is high school for me. That was my debate colleague, Ron. <laughs> I, I love that shot. <laughs> just one of my favorite shots. And I, I assume you all know Abraham Lincoln. Right? There we are. Okay, point number two. We need to recognize that ultimately, as Tolkien said, each person is a unique being, but endowed with universal qualities. And we can take it in the religious sense that Tolkien understood it, or we can take it in much more secular sense that we see in the Declaration of Independence. Each man in alienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? That's what we have to think about. So each person, incarnate soul, born in a certain time and a certain place. And therefore, what is that time and what is that place? So point three, we also understand people, I think, sometimes best by understanding what their relations are to one another. So obviously, if you're writing about someone who's an academic, you want to know how did he deal with his colleagues and how did he deal with his students. So I brought up Tolkien already. I brought up uh, his best friend, C.S. Lewis. But it's fascinating to look, and I've had the chance to go back and look at both of these guys. Tolkien rarely got along with his colleagues, but all of his students loved him. Lewis almost always got along with his colleagues, but his students didn't think much of him. And that's interesting. They're best friends, two different people, but we have to ask why. What's that relationship about? And I think part of it is (coughs) Tolkien was very sensitive, and therefore when he met with students, he was sensitive to their needs, and he was very fatherly, and he was very open to them. But when he was with his colleagues, they rubbed him the wrong way because he was sensitive. And I think someone like Lewis, who has all the confidence in the world, could always hold his own with his colleagues. But his students, he always belittled, just a little bit, if nothing else, just because of his raw intelligence and the kind of power behind who and what he was. But my point is, relations matter and relations change. How does he treat his spouse? How does he treat his students? How does he treat his colleagues? How does he treat his neighbor? And very famously, it's been said, we can often judge a person now by not how they treat their equals, but by how they treat their inferiors. And there's something to that. So when you're thinking about these subjects for this class, what is the relationship that you have there? It's my best friend from college and his family. What do you have there when you're trying to figure out what matters in terms of how we relate one to another? What are their friends like? Who do they eat with in the cafeteria? What do they talk about? when they eat together in the cafeteria? What about when they're over at Mu Alpha or they're at the ATO house? What, what's, what's it like? What kind of relations do you have? What about when they're at church? How do they think about these things? So relations really matter in the way that we understand ourselves. Earlier, probably 10 years ago, guys, uh, your, your cohorts, but 10 years ago, we took a trip out to the cemetery in a Civil War class and found this neat grave, so we all stood by it. Okay, point number four. It's history. Time matters. Time matters because time gives us the context for the story. Time is, in many ways, the story. And we're trying to find points of favor in what that story is and what that story could be. So we're never going to escape our context. We can fight against our context but we're never truly going to escape. And I think that really matters as we're thinking about who and what we are and as people and trying to understand our subjects. Okay, 
Anybody have any, any final questions? These are just a couple books I would recommend if you want to understand good biography. Some of my favorite, the best autobiography I've ever read is Malcolm X's. Again, an exercise in self-indulgence, but so honest and so raw at times. Surprised by Lewis, C.S. Lewis's autobiography, also by Michael. Also an exercise in self-indulgence, but still very good because he's able to distance himself a little bit from it. David McCullough's John Adams. I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's beautifully written. It's not perfect because you would come away reading this biography never knowing that John Adams was the intellectual that he was. You would never know that he was the author of 20 books because that's not what McCullough focuses on. McCullough focuses on his character and he focuses on him as a statesman, not as a scholar. And I think that's a flaw that he only has this one thing and yet that was a decision David McCullough made and he has a best selling million copy plus selling biography. I can't, I can't knock him. The guy did set out what he wanted to do, and he did well. You guys are reading The Lance and the Shield, one of my all-time favorite books. I think there is an example of a biography with very little evidence, where Utley is so good at telling us what we don't know and what we can guess. It's an amazing exercise in the way that Utley presents his history, because especially when Sitting Bull's a boy, we have hardly any information. And yet, what does Utley do? He goes to oral histories. He goes through the traditions of the tribe. And is it perfect evidence? Absolutely not. But it's good evidence, and it's the best evidence we have. And that's what makes that book so brilliant, that he's able to do that. And then one of my all-time favorite books as well is Joseph Pierce's Literary Converts, uh, a history of mass biography of people mostly who became Anglican in the 20th century, who left their kind of unbelief and joined the Anglican Church, but uh, just incredible. And you can see some of the figures up there and who these people are, Evelyn Waugh, G.K. Chesterton, so a number of different figures, but, but a really great book. Okay, so any questions on this or on the idea of what I want you to get at? I mean, I hope this helps. I hope this wasn't uh, just a detour, but actually gives you a sense of, yeah, Alex. But say that we're writing about a, a greater like a theme or a question about something there like autobiography this probably also applies mostly right <coughs> yeah yeah I would think so definitely I, I would hope so so yeah thanks for that anybody else okay well I'm going to talk a little bit about myself for a moment and I hope you guys will forgive me for that I'm going to be a little bit autobiographical here, but I'm going to talk about my family and talk about why I think they are so important to the settlement of the country, even though I have no war heroes. In fact, my, my family tended to be pacifists, and they left Germany in the 1760s because they didn't want to be conscripted in the military, and they left Russia in 1876 because they didn't want to be conscripted in the military, and they also didn't want to lose their faith in either of those places. So I'm going to talk about a very specific group of people called the Volga Germans, and I want to use them as a way of trying to understand how we can understand settlement patterns and try and address some of what Miles was talking about in settlement. But remember, his settlement, as he was talking about, was native white American settlement. And I'm going to be talking here about immigrants, those who come over and, and reshape the land. So the Volga Germans, as we'll see here in just a moment, are a very <coughs> sub specific subset of Germans. They're Germans who left, and this, if any of you are from Nebraska or Kansas, this, you have these people everywhere yeah, because that's where they settled. Almost all the Protestants went to Lincoln, Nebraska, and almost all the Catholics went to Hayes, Kansas, and settled in those regions. And we'll see a map up here in just a moment. But they had this beautiful understanding of what work was, as you can see here, on this immense land I inscribed with the blade of my plow the magnificent poem of work. And that really does define, I think, a lot of what they're trying to do. One of my favorite things as a kid, and I don't do this anymore, I haven't kept up this tradition, but my family was always supposed to go to Mass on the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker, and you always, there was a prayer, and I didn't bring it in, but it's a hilarious prayer. I mean, it's not meant to be hilarious. But it's, it's this prayer about, dear God, as we go into our creation and work with the earth, 
please let us end up with a high price market at the end of it. Right? That's the prayer. So it's a legitimate thing to pray for. Uh, but certainly that, that was part of what my family was supposed to do on every, it's, is it March 19th is the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker? But that's just a part of the family tradition that we're supposed to do that. So this is Holy Cross Church out in the middle of Kansas. And this is where my grandfather is from. My grandfather's name was Wendell and Basco. You don't need to write that down. But he and his family helped build this church. They quarried the stone from nearby. They designed the church themselves. And then they built this. And notice the town. And I want to kind of show you how this works. The town is Pfeiffer, Kansas. And it's just a little tiny place. It's not even on the interstate. If you guys go there uh, at some time, if you're driving across I-70, you have to get off the interstate and go about 30 miles to be able to find this. Uh, so it's off the interstate. It's worth seeing, but uh, incredible place. But definitely a little European village in the middle of Kansas in the way it's laid out, in the way the architecture is, everything. So there it is in Kansas. And you can see there's the, the big interstate, I-70, I which most of us just want to get across as quickly as we can. Yeah, even we have flyover co country, drive over country in all of this. But Pfeiffer's right there. Get a little bit closer off I-70. You go through a little town called Victoria, and you end up down here. And it's in a valley to Pfeiffer. But here's what's fascinating to me. There was, in fact, a Pfeiffer Russia. And Pfeiffer Russia was settled in 1763 because Catherine the Great invited all these Germans to come settle on the lower Volga and along the Black Sea to create this region of southern Russia as an agricultural paradise, but also, very importantly, to create a bulwark against all the Islamic forces that are south of them as well, and especially those from Kyrgyzstan which was the, the great kind of opponent of what Catherine was trying to do. The, the Kyrgyzstanis would be almost identical to our American Indians in terms of the relationship of Catherine the Great settlers and the native peoples of that region. But unlike our American Indians, they had an organized religion, which changes things, of course, and creates a kind of different uh, mindset. But all of the settlements of the Volga Germans we're along the Volga River. Here's the Volga River. There's Volgograd. And around specifically a community called Saratov, which is still a major Russian city to this point. So in 1763, they migrate from southern Germany and from northern Germany. There were, in this area here, these are all the villages of the Volga Germans. There are, and you can see there's, there's a Saratov. And, or, there's Saratov. And of these villages, there are, and it's hard to count, but there are probably about 115 of them. Six of them were Roman Catholic, one was Jewish, and all the rest were Lutheran. So that tells you about the settlement patterns of what's going on here. And the Catholic ones are not all together. They're actually spread out. But this is the one I want you to look at. There's Pfeiffer, Russia, right there. Now, Pfeiffer, Russia was destroyed by Stalin. Stalin hated the Volga Germans. And my people, my ancestors, got out in the 1870s, but not everybody left. There were still a number of Volga Germans who remained. This, if you can see right here, and I'll give you a close-up, that's where Pfeiffer, Russia was. Not too far from the Volga. Right over here, we've got mountains here, but we've got kind of great plains and steppe right there. But that's Pfeiffer. We'll get a little bit closer, and there you can see the abandoned city, especially after Stalin laid waste to it. All the villages around it are fine, but this one was taken out by Stalin, and you can see it's essentially a ghost town. But then we jump forward. In 1876, these people, for the most part, migrated from here and came to Kansas. Now, why is that important for a moment? Why think about what the landscape is like here and what the landscape is like in Kansas? Alex? Is it like the idea that we talked about earlier about the the neo Europe's, yeah. you know, where people usually settle where they're most comfortable living in, yeah. um, where they can thrive. And so a, an area like Pfeiffer, Russia, probably felt a lot like Kansas, and so they set up a new Pfeiffer. Yeah, uh, it, exactly. It's well stated, Alex. So you have the same kind of grasses, 
you have the same kind of soil, you have the same kind of rainfall, and it's all confusing to the Europeans because they need at least 15 inches of rain, and suddenly, and they're used to 45 inches of rain a year, and suddenly you're down to seven or eight inches of rain a year, and you have to go to dry farming. They're not good at this. They don't have the right plows. They don't have the right windmills. None of that. They're not used to tornadoes. All of those things is basically were part of this southern Russian experience, all of it. And so everything that they learn about how to plant certain wheat, and they were very good, they cultivated a certain wheat, and you guys do need to know this for uh, your ex final exam, they cultivated what was call, called hard red winter turkey wheat. Hard red winter turkey wheat. And it, it's an amazing innovation in the growth of wheat. So hard red winter turkey wheat. You actually plant it in the winter and the seed germinates and spends the time <coughs> in the soil absorbing the moisture from the snow so that when spring comes, it's ready to grow. It, it, it's amazing what it is. And it, it's, it is our wheat. It's what made America the breadbasket of the world. In fact, ironically, these people who left Russia in Nebraska and Kansas were feeding the Soviets in the 1970s and the 1980s because they couldn't keep up with their own agriculture, and partly because of what Stalin had done during his reign. But here we go. Here's Pfeiffer, Kansas, deserted. I'm sorry, Pfeiffer, Russia. And here's Pfeiffer, Kansas. Right? Similar environment, similar layout to the town. As Alex said, almost identical in terms of soil, in terms of rainfall, everything. And they just transfer the whole community from one continent to another in a massive move. And that, that's incredible to think about what these people are doing. So generally, when we think about immigrants, and we'll talk more about this as we get into the class for this, the, the second half of the semester, but immigrants almost always travel in family groups. And depending on how traditional they are, they also, often also travel as communities, and they'll reform those communities. So Kansas is actually an amazing place for this. Uh, you go to a place like New York City, or you go to Chicago, and you'll have a Swedish neighborhood, and then you'll have an Ethiopian neighborhood, and then you'll have a German neighborhood, and then you'll have an Irish neighborhood. The same thing happens in Kansas, except rather than it being neighborhoods, it's towns. So you're driving across I-70. Here's a French community. Get off the interstate. Go look at the gravestones. They're in French. And then you have a Bohemian community next to that. And you get out and you go look, and what do you have? All the graveyards are in Bohemia. In Bohemian. And it's always fascinating, too, because especially most of these places, again, are either Catholic or Lutheran. Catholic cemeteries are fascinating in more ways than non-Catholic cemeteries are for this reason. Catholics always have saints in their cemeteries, and it gives it a certain character that allows you to figure out the ethnicity pretty quickly. So you go into a Bohemian community, you go to a Bohemian cemetery, and what are you going to see? Bohemian saints. Not saints that they're going to be having in France or in Italy, but specifically Bohemian saints. And that, that's very telling about trying to figure out who these people are and what they're trying to do. So here you can see just, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Nolan. I'm just curious as to like, like when there would be these like, family migrations. Yeah. Um, why, why certain places? So like, why Kansas? Why not like Iowa or like, I mean, right. any other kind of like frontier-ish yeah. kind of place? I mean, I understand, I understand why not like the original kind of like 13 states. Sure. I mean, but like, yeah, why not even like Pennsylvania or something like that, which I know is like original, but I don't know. Like, right. How do they settle on, how would they settle on the land? A lot of it, so a lot of it has to do with what's available right then, right? So, I mean, just like we are, we're renting houses. Now, it's, the market is limited. We only have a certain number of choices. Same thing is true for them. There are places that are already very crowded. So St. Louis is already crowded. Cincinnati is crowded. So they're looking for a place where, and specifically, these will be Germans, they're looking for a place where they can practice the same kind of farming and the same type of community, and they really only had two choices. They could either go to Kansas or Nebraska, or they could go to Argentina. That, those were, if they wanted an environment similar to what they had, 
that's what they had to look for. And so they do, they actually send agents out. They, they pick people from the community who go a year or two early, and they will spend a year just searching out what this land is. And they're paid for by the old community. The old community funds them to do this. And then you can imagine if they make a mistake. I mean, you've got, you've got a thousand people depending on them. Right. Right. And I'm also yeah. curious as to like how they yeah. Like, yeah. They know where to go. <laughs> and then they negotiate. So they go to the shipping lines and they say, look, we're going to have a thousand people in the What kind of price can you do? And then these people know what they're trying to figure out how to do that. And then we get to New York, and land in New York. Well, then what? We've got to take the train. Well, we're going to have to take a couple of different trains. Well, the trains give us freight. Well, they're not going to give us special rates unless we actually buy land from the railroad. If we take public land that's available, they'll get us close, but they won't give us a special rate at all because they're trying to sell their land. So a lot of it just has to do with what's open at the time, but also what these people are looking for in terms of creating a similar kind of environment. So you think about this, and I, I just I happened to drive through this on Friday, because Deidre and I went to North Dakota. You drive through the Dells of Wisconsin, it looks just like Germany. I mean, and of course, who settles there? It's Germans who settle in the Dells of Wisconsin. And the same thing is true. A lot of Minnesota looks like Sweden and looks like Norway. And so a lot of these places where people come, they're looking for places that remind them. And not just, it's not just nostalgia, it's also necessity. I know a dairy farm in this kind of environment. I, I go to Arizona and have a clue what to do. Right? Even though I was an extremely good farmer here, I can't do that same kind of farm. So that a lot of this, again, it's availability, but also what they're trying to look for to create their community. Does that yeah. answer you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Ethan. Um, I hope this is bringing it too far off track. It's okay. How, how assimilated into like, like Ameri American culture do these, uh, do these immigrants become, or how, how much yeah. of it do they end up influencing? Because like, I know that you know, by World War I, you start to see a lot of very harsh, like, yeah. Uh, sort of pushes to like you know no longer speak the German right. in there, but but that before then it was a pretty vibrant like community that yeah. was there. If, if this helps, yeah. So I'm fifth generation. My grandmother's third generation. She did not speak English until she was in her thirties. Everything, her schooling, every all the farming, everything was done in German. Everything, and it's a weird German. I mean, she used to speak it to me, and it's nothing like what I learned in German class. Um, it, it, it's this kind of, I mean, I would almost call it sloppy German. Everything's been slurred together, and, and but it, it is German, but it, it's 1763 German. It's German that never evolved beyond where that people was at that point. I'll, I'll give you another example, and this is probably not politically correct in our day and age, but the woman who owned the mercantile store where my grandmother grew up was black. My grandmother never called her black. She called her English because she spoke English. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's amazing, right, to think about that. And so when you're talking about how assimilated were they, not really. I mean, not until, so my mother was the first generation to be raised speaking English, even though she's fourth generation. So, and, and then she rejected completely. That's what, you know, the German is what old people do. That's what the, <laughs> and my mom was very rock and roll very very 50s. So that's, uh, she's 80, 85 now. Um, that, that just, that was old fashioned to do that stuff. She's an American, not at all like her parents. And my grandmother had a German accent until she died. And she could never get pronouns right. My, every dog was a baby. It didn't matter. <laughs> my dog's name is Molly. She, he, no, grandma. <laughs> she, no, it's a dog, so it's gotta be a he. So, yeah, maybe, no one. Maybe you already said this, but where? Where did she live? Like, where were those three generations? Yeah, they, they lived outside of East Kansas. <coughs> okay. So, oh, Piper's awesome. awesome. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just okay. right. In, so, she grew up in a town called Ellis, right outside, but it's all Ellis County. Okay. Yeah. So, here's here's a good map of where the Volga Germans settle. So, how well did they assimilate? I love this. This is from the newspaper accounts at the time, talking about, and they call them Russians. R U R R. R O O S I A N. They're not, even though they're not Russian at all, they're German, but they lived in Russia, so they're Russians. So a big Russian was reposing him up the depot platform while his frau was patiently picking the vermin from his head. 
I, not, not a nice image at all, I, at all. They seldom change their garments. They eat with their fingers from the same dish. Their cooking is done in an exceedingly primitive style. Now, how much have we assimilated? Have you ever seen me eat? <laughs> the sweet simplicity of our Russian people is never so vividly illustrated as when a maiden of 16 summers blows her nose on the rear of her dress. And then my favorite, their presence is unmistakable. For where they are, there is also something else. A smell so pungent and potent as to make a strong man weak. We seriously object to having our streets turned into manure heaps and a depository <coughs> of filth. That's, and we talk about bigotry now. This is very typical. Almost every immigrant group had these same kinds of things said about them. It didn't matter if they were Hispanic or Irish or Italian or Russian German. This is the norm. We are, we are always, we have always been welcoming to immigrants. We've never really loved the immigrant in the way that we think of our relationship in America. And yet, we are a nation of immigrants. It's what we are and who we are. But then, one of my favorite, and another newspaper says, and while Eastern capitalists are invited to consider the many advantages afforded by this locality, Ellis County, over others, we should not forget that when these hardy sons of toil settle in our midst, they do it with a view of making themselves at home. People as a class who are so industrious and so economical are bound to prosper in a country like ours. And again, this is where we get our wheat. The entire basis of our agriculture of wheat comes from the Russian Germans who brought this over, both the Mennonites as well as the Lutherans and the Catholics who brought all of this over. There, there is the main church in Pfeiffer. Again, all handcrafted, hand-designed, handcrafted, that stone is all native limestone, quarry, the quarry, you can still drive to the quarry, and every parishioner in the town, it's all Catholic, everybody's Catholic, there's no non-Catholics in town, everybody's Catholic, everybody's a member of this community, and they were all charged with paying a tithe in stone in order to build this church. And so everything <coughs> they had to go quarry stone or pay someone to quarry the stone to bring their allotment of stone to pay for the church. Right? That, that's how they did it. And they didn't have money. They're, they're not wealthy by any means, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Alex. How many people live in this town? Now, it's probably about 150, 200. At its height, it was probably only about 300. It was always a small village. So, yeah. Here, uh, inside, the main stained glass. It's fascinating. All the architecture inside is beautiful. In and of itself, you get this kind of nice view here of the sunflower, a very Kansas scene, with there's the church in the background and that and that. But this, yeah, pretty incredible. Beautiful lighting inside. Okay, so I told you I was gonna get a little personal here, and I will for a moment. This is my great aunt Cecilia. And this is this story I think should mean something to all of us to imagine what happens. She is twenty one. Uh, everything I know about her, she was a, a force of nature, just this incredible woman, and you can see a close-up picture of her there, <coughs> at 21. Right? So that, that's on the gravestone. But she caught tetanus. And so the whole community came together and raised all the cash they could. They raised $200, that's all the cash that was in the whole community. Someone got in the car and drove five hours to Kansas City the closest city that had a tetanus shot. Paid for the shot, got back, gave the shot to my aunt, and she died about an hour later. It's just amazing to think about these things and the kinds of hardships that these people had to go through. I, <laughs> I just have to say, she has always haunted me. Um, <laughs> not, not in a literal sense, but I have just been taken with her story ever since I was a kid. Uh, what a story. And she was married, uh, not married, she was engaged to a guy who became a priest after she died. So, uh, pretty interesting in and of itself. Okay, there's another famous church in the area. This one's north. Uh, it's called the Cathedral of the Plains, and you can actually see this from I-70. And any time you guys are going across I-70 to Colorado, it really is worth stopping and seeing this church. It's a similar story to the one we just saw in Pfeiffer. This is in a place called Victoria, or its German name is Herzog. 
that in Victoria, this uh, is a gorgeous homemade church. Again, all designed, quarried by local stone, everything uh, really beautiful. And there's the inside of it. You know, pretty stunning for just a local church, right, to, to think about. And that altar, everything is just amazing. Okay, I'm going to fast forward here because we're running out of time. Uh, I told you guys earlier in the semester when we were looking at photos about the iron crosses, this is a typical cemetery in this area. Uh, you can they use all kinds of parts. This is actually, these are fenders from cars that they have, that they put together for the cross. Uh, but this is typical because the wind blows so much. And your, your native stone is limestone, it's not marble. It's very expensive to import marble in the that was when these people were poor. So they just used steel and made kind of a folk art out of it, which is pretty neat. All right, there's my grandpa. Coolest guy I ever knew. Probably the coolest guy I ever will know. My mother sent me an email yesterday. This was not kind, because I sent her a photo, and she said, Bradley, you look just like my dad, but heavier. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. That's all I needed right now. Um, but anyway, there's my grandfather. He was, uh, he was a banker. He was a farmsman. <coughs> During the Great Depression, he survived by putting my mom and my grandmother in the car, and they would live out of the back of the car and pick beets during the summers because he was a teacher and he only got paid a few months out of the year. Uh, just an incredible guy in, in every way. But there you have an example of kind of a Volga German, and I think exemplifies the kind of sacrifice that all of us, I'm sure, have experienced of these people who gave everything to us. And then there's my grandmother right before she passed away. And I, I have to say this just because I love my grandmother so much. I already told you she was this amazing cook. And my mom was a good cook, but my grandmother, right? and it was just part of the tradition. Right? She was just stunning. It didn't matter what she made. Um, in fact, uh, the only people I have met who rival her are Will's mother and Mrs. Moreno in terms of the kinds of abilities they have for doing all of this variety of different things. But my grandmother was on the bed as she was dying and the priest was there, and he had just given her last rites, and my mother, who talks all the time, my mother and the priest are having this conversation over my grandmother. My grandmother knows she's going to die, and she grabs the hand and tells my mom to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, we've got to say the Lord's Prayer. And so they start saying the Lord's Prayer together, and right when it comes to the middle of the prayer, deliver us not from evil, or deliver us from evil, right? my grandmother passed away. <laughs> Cool last words. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>